The organist is uh, Lauren Berlingeri. Uh, and uh, welcome. Welcome. Um, so I hope we have you on Lauren monthly. And this is great. We really enjoyed it. I, I, I've been here from my fourth year. It's the first time I've really heard the organ you know, fully engaged. So that's wonderful. <coughs> Linda has an announcement for us, Linda Wicksburg. Here, let's turn this mic on. Good morning. Good morning. So Wednesday is the community lunch. That's why I'm dressed as Halloween. I'm also on Halloween. And, uh, but I just first wanted to uh, kind of update you on what's going on with um, Kelly Shelter and uh, first of all, the, I want to acknowledge Ruth Draper for the, I took seven sleeping mats over to Tent City uh, about a week and a half ago, and the first person that came up uh, to get one was a man who looked like he was about 80 years old. So he would have a more comfortable sleep after that. So thank you, Ruth, for keeping your group together. I, I don't get to go up there because of the COVID to encourage you, but thank you. Um, I thank you and they do too. Um, Kelly Shelter has moved to its new location. They're settled in. They have about 80 residents instead of 64. And our, our cooking team, Charlene and Jen, and I went over and served dinner. Uh, and they've invited us to come back, so I guess we did okay. Yeah. Uh, and um, so we got to have that interaction and and uh, uh, with the folks over there. There is room for five families. There's five rooms that you can have families sleep there. And the uh, the general sleeping area is huge. I don't know if you had a chance to see it on uh, the videos on the news. Uh, but the, the folks that are there are much more relaxed. They're not on top of each other like they were at this other location. So anyway, I just wanted to update you that what's going on around the city. Now, um, for the community lunch, uh, we're going to have chili dogs, Jen's fruit salad, and honey baked corn. And uh, uh, we also would like to have some Halloween cupcakes. So I have a lot of cake mixes back in the pantry if you're interested in making. And by Halloween, I just mean orange frosting or yellow frosting, that sort of thing. Um, and if you come to volunteer, dress like Halloween. So, and why haven't you come to volunteer? Or come to have lunch, so I'm here to ask you for that. Show up about 10.30 and we'll find something for you to do. And then you can sit down and have lunch and interact with folks. And that would be great. And I just also want to share uh, the testimony. We had a, a volunteer um, that came that saw the um, uh, request for volunteers in Craigslist. Thank you, uh, Missy. And he had come to the food pantry uh, over the years a number of times. I recognized his face. And he came to work in the pantry. And he said that when he came here to come in and sit down and have a plate, silverware, a napkin, a cup of coffee, a meal, and a dessert, and if you just sit and relax, meant everything. And that people look forward to that lunch. So I just wanted to share a little bit of what's happening out there with you. So, thank, thank you, you so much. Mm -hmm. Are there any other um, announcements for the good of the congregation? The flower calendar is filling up, yeah. The flower calendar is filling up. The flower calendar is filling up. And in a step of the way, we'd love to have Halloween candy, but no skins. All right. In a step of the way, we'd like to have Halloween candy. Yeah. Right. With that, let us uh, join in the greeting. Please rise. We worship because the Lord stood by us on difficult days. Even when we're in our home. We worship because the Lord gives strength. Even when we feel so weak. We worship because we have been rescued again and again. Even when we are afraid that we have lost. 
Come and worship the God who stands with us in our darkest days and promises to be with us to the end. We will worship, worship his hope, <laughs> seeking power, our, I think. We will worship his hope, seeking eyes to see and hearts to believe in God with us. Amen. I hope you know this hymn. Uh, it's uh, one of my favorite hymns. Hymn in thee, I sing the almighty power of God. And if you'd like to look in your handle, it's page 152. Mm -hmm. He's not looking at himself. He's looking at the other guy, right? Yeah, yeah. 
and pass a judgment. Right. He, exactly. Exactly. He thinks he's better than the other person. Right. But in God's eyes, is one person better than the other? No. No, that's hard for us to gather because we do want to think some people are better than others. But in God's eyes, we all need mercy. We're all worthy of love. Right? Right. Okay. That's the story I'm telling this morning. Well, that's the story we're going to read this morning. Okay. okay. So let's pray. Repeat after me. Dear Lord, Dear Lord thank you. Thank that you love us all. And you give us all second chances and third chances and fourth chances and on and on. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, welcome everyone. It's good to have you here. And it rained yesterday. Yay! And it feels like it's fall. Yay! Yay! It was so nice to wrap up in those blankets last night. Oh. Yeah. Uh, if, as you uh, pass a piece, especially extend the hand to someone you don't know or you haven't seen in a while. And if you'd like to more about the church, fill out those few pads and let us all know your attendance. So let's say the pass a piece. that connects the two hemispheres, left and right of the brain. 
and ACC, the corpus callosum, is partially or completely absent. It's caused by a disruption of brain cell migration during fatal development. I discovered my condition, ACC, only after I had to have an MRI, only a decade, decade ago. In order, I had to have the MRI in order to claim disability and SSI. Before the diagnosis, and even after, I have to be honest, I was labeled weird, slow, clumsy, socially inept, on and on, even by my own family. I was constantly asked, can't you do anything right? The answer is yes, I can, and so can other people with disabilities. I can't pass the driver's road test, but I drove my uncle's tractor and helped him out on the farm. I've got a good strong thumb here. We had a stick shift. But before my arthritis flared up, I could ride my bicycle for miles. I don't have the mental dexterity to work large jigsaw puzzles, but I'm a dad hand at solving word puzzles. I can't always control how loud or high my voice is, but I do know how to use my voice to praise people. And I mean, I, I could go on and talk about my life for hours. You'll have to wait for the book. <laughs> In conclusion, Please take the words of Mary T. Glaithoy, and we need to study her in the women's group. Lathrop was a licensed Methodist Episcopal preacher in 1871, and because of her words, we have, remember to walk a mile in another person's shoes before you judge them. Please take that to heart. Amen. 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 Thank you. Well done, Kat. Thank you. Yes. Well done. It helps us understand um, one another better what we know of disabilities. It really does. And to be to reach out. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. What are those people and places we'd like to uh, pray for? Yes, we need to be praying for. Bill um, uh, and Cindy McDonald. Yeah. Bill has really failed a lot and is having difficulty even getting motivated. Cindy is off with a cold today. Not COVID, and she said to tell everybody, oh, she really missed coming in. But we need to keep both of them in our prayer, Cindy and Bill McDonald. For those who uh, are newer here, Bill McDonald was a, a pastor here, a beloved pastor here for many years, and this is his church in retirement. And um, it, it, uh, Alzheimer's has really, uh, it's hard to, uh, to, to wait him right now. Uh, we don't know if that will be that way for ongoing or if it's, if it's this is the period he's going through. Yes. My son and his wife are traveling through Wyoming in a snowstorm today. Okay. All right. I would enjoy it today. My sister's uh, birthday. My oldest birthday today. It's your oldest sister's birthday. Yeah. Very good. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very good. Others. Well, let us pray. Our response for our prayer um, is that we may know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Lord, we are known by you. You know both our noble and our dark thoughts. You know our selfish deeds and those actions we'd like to hide. You also know our aspirations and better selves. You know our successes and our regrets. And you love us. You love us as a good parent loves her child. Help us, Lord, to claim that love. And may that love heal us and make us whole. 
And when we've offended or been offended or angered, give us the ability to love as you have loved us. And that we may know Christ and the power of his resurrection. We pray for the church. We pray for the church, wherever that might be, the church under persecution and in war. We pray for the church at work in dangerous and oppressive places. We pray for the church, wherever it has become complacent, seeks to recapture its mission. We pray for those who remain devoted and desire to know the love of God and neighbor. And to know we may know Christ and the power of his resurrection. We pray for those who are struggling to make ends meet. For those who are struggling for themselves and their families or any who are burdened by financial debt. But for those who have lost their homes and are on the street, or any who worry that they will not have enough for next month's rent, pray for them that they may know Christ and the power of his resurrection. We pray for those who struggle with addiction, and those who struggle with those who struggle with addiction, that they may know Christ and the power of his resurrection. We pray for this city where we made our home and the cities from which we come. We pray for our schools, that they would be nurturing places and safe. We, we pray for law enforcement and what they see from day to day. Give them empathy when they're worn thin. At this time of year, especially, we, we pray for elected officials and we pray for ourselves as we elect. That our leaders would be servants. Give us all a love for our neighbor, even the neighbor we find difficult to love, and that we may know Christ and the power of his resurrection. For our homes, we pray for our homes, that they would be places of welcome and peace. We pray for our homes where there is discord, bring resolution. But when we have become exasperated. Give us patience. When there is a weariness set in, give us strength. And if there be violence in our home, show us a way out. That we may know Christ and the power of his resurrection. For all who are in our circle of care, for our children and for our grandchildren in our care and family life. We pray for those in our families who suffer daily because of illness and for those caretakers. For any whose bodies are failing and for those whose minds have become confused. And we give thanks for the continued birth, for new life, for babies, for expectant mothers, for fathers. In all these things, we pray that we may know Christ and the power of his resurrection. For this congregation, guide us, give us clarity of mission, and give us hope, always give us laughter, 
and give us courage. We would do your good work in this world. Hear now the prayer that you taught us, and it's up on your screen. Our Creator in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us our bread for our needs from day to day, and forgive us our offenses as we have forgiven our offenders. And do not let us enter into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We have a prayer response. Can you play for us? One, two, and let me know. Good morning. This is a song called More Like You, and it's by Scott Wesley Brown. <laughs> Scott was in front of me. Oh, my. 
Can any idols of the nations spring rain, or can the heavens give showers? Is it not you, O Lord, our God? We set our hope on you, for it is you who do all this. In Luke 18, 9 through 14, he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give a tenth of all my income, but the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his chest, breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other two. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those, all who humble themselves will be exalted. Amen. Our hymn, and um, we'll, sing, um, three, we'll sing three verses. Uh, rather than the five, um, depth of mercy. This is a, a good uh, blessing hymn. We may remain seated. We'll do the three verses.
fairly straightforward at a glance, but if you sit with it for a few minutes and think through it, you can really get tied up in knots. The tax collector is good because he's humble. Pharisee is bad because he's not. Which means that in the end, the tax collector is right with God and the Pharisee is not, right? As a matter of fact, the Pharisee is rather rude. He stands up by himself and prays, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. I'm not like thieves, rogues, rogues excuse me, adulterers, and even like that tax collector over there. So, the lesson would be, don't be like the Pharisee. Be like the tax collector. The trouble with that reading is that you don't want to be like a tax collector. That's saying you want to be like the mafia. That's saying you want to be like uh, Michael Corleone, right? You don't want to be like Mark Co Michael Corleone, right? Essentially, tax collectors were like mob bosses collecting taxes for the oppressor, talking a high percentage, and threatening a household that they didn't come up with cash. But then, you shouldn't be like rogues and thieves and adulterers either. So, maybe you should be like a Pharisee. Maybe you should be like that Pharisee. I mean, did you see here what that Pharisee had to say? He said he tithed, he tithed his income. Preachers like to hear that. If we all tithe our income, we'd be, we'd be a happy church. We'd be rich for God. Right? 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 Yeah, very good. Yeah. He also said that he, he fasted twice a week. There's no place in the Bible that says you should fast twice a week. That's just saying, this was a really good dude. This was a holy man. This is a good dude. So, maybe, maybe we should be like a Pharisee. Except, except don't be like a Pharisee. Because according to our passage, he's not right with God. Be like the tax collector. He goes home justified, right with God. But, but don't be like, don't be like the tax collector. Don't be like the tax collector. You understand what I'm saying? You keep following this reasoning through and you get all tied up with mugs. So who in this who in this parable folks? Who are we supposed to be like? Jesus. Well, James. <laughs> I could just end the sermon right now. <laughs> But I won't. <laughs> perhaps, oh gosh, perhaps we should only be like the tax collector and that he humbled himself, right? We don't want to be like the Pharisee who's all haughty and proud, do we? No. But did you hear what I just did when I said that? We don't want to be like the tax collector all haughty and proud. I sounded just like what Jesus said we shouldn't sound like when he said he didn't want to be like a tax collector. Yeah, I committed the very offense that, that the parable is teaching against. You know, good thing I'm not like that person over there. Oh, we say that often, right? Right, right. Oh, God, keep us humble. Keep us humble. Make us, James, more like Jesus, right? There we go. As I was um, ruminating over this parable this past week, I recalled an interview some years ago with um, Steve Carell. You all know Steve Carell. You know that a wonderful, okay, I'm showing my taste in humor, I'm sorry. The sitcom that he was in, The Office, he did an interview when he was exiting the, seat, exiting the show. And um, he said, he, he shed some light um, on our parable when he talked about his character. This is what he said. Well, the, the interview asked him, well, how would you describe, how would you, just, you, you all know what I'm talking about, how would you describe Michael Scott? His answer was this. He said, Michael Scott is someone with an enormous, an enormous emotional blind spot. He is someone who truly does not understand how to perceive himself. And that's important. Like, kind of like a Pharisee. Right? And if he did gain that knowledge, he said his head would have exploded. He just wasn't able to, he wouldn't be able to assimilate all that information of, of the really truth about himself. He's got this blind spot. 
He wouldn't be able to take in all that information. Yeah, yeah. He would kind of like that. It's like the Pharisee. He goes on to say that, you know, but the, this, this guy, this character he's playing, isn't a bad person. He's just so blinded by himself. He's ignorant. And because of that, he's misguided. He can't seem to be able to see himself. And it's true. Whether we want to admit, admit it, we're all a little bit, or a lot, a lot, like Michael Scott. And our ability to not see it to not see that we indeed have a blind spot is really affirmation that we have a blind spot, right? Kind of goes in circles, like a parable. In Christian language, we would say that's part of being a fallen people. We miss the mark. And we miss the mark. We miss the mark. Oh, God help us. Some years ago, I took part in a poverty assimilation and an impact on it was an exercise, an afternoon exercise, through a non-profit agency called Crisis Assistance in a Large City, where I lived. That really uh, got involved in people's lives that lived on the financial edge or had fallen off the edge. And it was an afternoon of role play. So people like me, middle income people, people who could pay their bills and stuff, play these roles. You were, you were given a card and you were the mother they had to decide if she was that month going to pay the rent or going to pay the child care for the child she had that allowed her to go to work to pay the rent because she didn't have enough. Or you were the fellow who was in debt, financial debt, because his wife was battling cancer and they were about to lose their home. Or the young person who had mental illness and because of that and the lack of care, she had been in and out of the criminal justice system. And so there you were. Perhaps your phone is cut off, so you can't call the people who, the renter or the person you owe that money to. Or your car has been repossessed, so you can't get to work. Or you've gone home and you've found your belongings out on the sidewalk. And they have the whole place set up like a city. They've actually got real loan officers there, and social workers, and disappointed family, the criminal justice system. And after an afternoon of that, you begin to understand the ramifications and complexities of just trying to fix it, because it's so difficult to fix, because you don't have an address, and you've got to have an address when you go to these places. You don't have a line of credit, so you have no way to get what you need to get, because you lost that line of credit, and it goes on and on. And of course, it's just an afternoon. It's not your lived experience. So it's an assimilation project, but it's um, I think what you really come out of it with, if you're paying attention, is that you've got some blind spots. And you'll you got those blind spots. And you'll live with those blind spots unless you have a terrible misfortune of finding yourself in that situation, that circumstance. And if you get anything from it, it's that you are humbled by your neighbor's struggle. Oh God, I thank you that I'm not like that. Right? I must have done something right. Right? Right? I did it right? Maybe I just did it right? I don't know. Well, I know it sounds harsh, but that's an offense to God. Isn't that part of what this parable is teaching us? blind spot or just not recognizing the blind spot. Oh, I don't even want to think I've got that. And there are so many ways that we live out and articulate that blind spot day to day. I admit it. A few weeks ago, I came out of the church. I was actually walking across the street because every time once in a while I go across the street get candy. You know, what you do? Get candy. You come back in the office and you eat it. And I was going across the street, and there was a woman right over here on the sidewalk that was getting on her bike, 
age. She's kind of my age, maybe a little younger. That's happening more often. And she was stumbling some. And she looked, it was a warm, hot day. And she looked at her. And what I say, said to her was, I ride my bike too. I said, trying to be encouraging. And she looked at me and replied the way she should have replied. I wouldn't be riding this bike if I owned a car. And the truth is, I knew that about her. And my encouragement and raw, raw attitude was shallow. It was my blind spot. Because I drive a car when I want to. Yeah, it's that blind spot. That I don't even, I you don't know, see the privilege. Just, you know, you can do it. Once again, the trouble with the Pharisee, and then with us, isn't just that he has blind spots, it's that he doesn't see his blind spots, and that's why he needs God's mercy. And he, he's not, he, he, he refuses to reckon with it. And so, there's not a whole lot of redemption there for him. You and I really don't know what a parent goes through who has a child with a profound disability. I mean, we'd like to think we know. Or what it means to live with mental illness and to find yourself on the street. Which, 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 which doesn't mean that we can't offer kindness. And it doesn't mean that we can't offer empathy. It just means our approach is different. It is one of humility and awe. It means that, believe it or not, you and I don't have the talent to fix another person's problems. But it means we can be kind. It means we can ask questions. It means we can search out, how can I be a good neighbor? How can I be a friend? Before we just plunge in. There, there's, there's now a lexicon of terms and phrases in American society that have become so politicized that this does, despite their instructive intent and maybe their academic intent of learning, they become lightning rods of controversy. And, and they're making people angry. And I'm really sorry about that. One of those terms is systemic racism, or sometimes called institutional racism. And it's simply referring to those structures and policies and society that have put people of color, and I think for being in the South for so long, African American people, at a distance from their white counterparts and income wealth and access to many of the benefits that so many of us have. Just those things that are there, they're just there, that had been there, like redlining, like banks not getting loans for mortgages, like the way jury pools had worked for so long. And we don't like them, because what those things do, that, those, those things, they, they point out our blind spots that we just don't really want to see. We don't want to see it. We don't want to know it. And it makes us angry. We get ticked. I mean, I had to really think about whether I was even going to bring it up. Kind of, oh, people are going to get ticked. Hmm. It's important to know that the world in which Jesus lived, when the audience heard this parable, they were really upset. It ruffled feathers. It's interesting, a page down, another paragraph down, Jesus then predicts his death. People are angry because the tax collector gets off with mercy. They don't, for good reason, like tax collectors, really good reason. The Pharisees were the ones that kept the temple going. They don't like that. The audience would have not thought of the Pharisee as a bad person. We don't think of Michael Scott as a bad person. Hopefully you don't think of me as a bad person. Right? They would have thought of him as decent. The truth is, before God, he needs repentance. 
repentance. Despite his tithing and his, his what was the other thing he did? His, his, his fasting. He, he, he needs that repentance just as much as anybody else. Only reason the tax collector is the one that has the mercy that's put right with God is because he's laying his face down on the prayer mat in humility and not looking around. He's begging for mercy. We're all caught up in this world together. You know, I like my iPhone. I do. It connects me to the world. And I feel kind of smart with it. My iPhone. You got it too, I'm sure. My iPhone, my smartphone. And I pull it out of my pocket, right? And then I read that the Apple Corporation has been for a long time now in charge of breaking international labor laws and making this gadget. Breaking labor laws in some horrible ways. And I really don't want to see it. I don't want to know it. Because I like my iPhone. I don't want to be caught up in the fallen world this way, but I'm not getting rid of my iPhone. Get what I'm saying? It's my blind spot. I don't want to know that time when these children are suffering to make this gadget for them. And I think for the Pharisee, it was something in the first century like that. I do. I think it was something like that. He just doesn't want to see it. So make me humble. Just make me humble. That's the way to start. And the last time in which I lived, I became a pretty good friend with the African American pastor down the street, who, let me tell you, he could preach, and his choir would sing. We would do pulpit swaps. And uh, I, mean, I think I can honestly say the white congregation got the better deal. <laughs> I mean, whoa, that music, whoa, it was overpowered. It was wonderful. My choir was good too, just different stuff. And I, I, I got to know him, and I would go to his family's food truck from time to time. And we would go to lunch. And I suggested a restaurant that I frequented. Now, this is, this is a small town in um, Thomasville, in North Carolina, the Piedmont. And it was called Sunrise Cafe, right? And it was a good place, clean, fair prices. And I said, let's, let's go here, let's meet there. I didn't notice the hesitation in his voice until afterward. I thought, oh, yeah, there was a hesitation there. And there was also a timidity in this very self-assured black man when we went into the restaurant that I didn't notice, I didn't see it until later. And we sat at the table, and we waited, and we waited, and we waited for the waitress to take our order. And this is, yeah, we waited for a long time. People around us had gotten their food and left. Then I realized when we finally got two glasses of water what was taking place. And how could I have not seen it? I didn't see it. I really didn't see it. When he said to me, Ben, there's a reason why we don't come here. Have you ever seen a black person in this restaurant? You come here all the time. And I didn't notice. That town is, what, 30, 30% black. And I had never seen, I didn't notice that I had never seen a black person in the restaurant. And there was a reason for that. And so he said to me, it's not going to help you. It's not going to help the whole white boy get saying, just sit down and wait for the food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have my blind spots. So do you. And knowing this should make me humble. It's the way to start. You know, I've, I've said it. Thank God I'm not like that homeless person sleeping under the bridge. I got a bed and three meals a day. 
Thank God I'm not stuck with an unwanted pregnancy, especially nowadays. Thank God I'm not struggling with addiction. Thank God I don't fight those same demons that have ravaged them. But I don't know what struggles are fighting in the wee hours of the night. I don't know. I don't know. All I know is I've got my blind spots. And I need the mercy of God. Let us say that.